Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Felipe Palma. Actualmente funjo como gerente general de la empresa Promimex Tecnologías. Tengo 40 años y soy originario de la ciudad de Monclova, Coahuila. Agradezco el clúster minero de Zacatecas a los ingenieros Gerardo Gándara y Alberto Mendoza por la invitación a participar en la segunda semana de procesamiento de minerales. Hoy miércoles 19 y mañana jueves 20 estaremos exponiendo el tema de muestreo correcto con nuestro invitado especial, el doctor Francis Vitar, exper experto número uno en consultoría de muestreo, control estadístico y gestión de calidad. Agradecemos también a nuestra representada Tecromin, Tecnología de Procesamiento de Minerales, quien es líder a nivel mundial en sistemas de muestreo, así como el fundador de Tecromin, el ingeniero Juan Carlos Michel, Patricia Michel y Mario Marquet. Igualmente los ingenieros Rodrigo Morales, gerente de procesos, y Rubén Aravena, gerente del departamento de muestreo, quienes nos acompañarán en estos dos días junto a sus colaboradores y equipo de trabajo. Brevemente, les comento que Promimex es una empresa que se fundó en el año 2014, donde fue fundada por dos personas. Este 2020 nos enorgullece que nuestro equipo de trabajo se ha expandido a 25 empleados. El crecimiento tan rápido, día a día, y nuestro objetivo ha sido por obtener y satisfacer la necesidad de nuestros clientes. Por ende, en estos últimos años, la recomendación de boca en boca nos ha llevado de representar una marca en el 2014 a representar al día de hoy 12 marcas extranjeras, con las cuales orgullosamente somos capaces de ofrecer una solución integral a nuestros clientes de cada una de estas marcas en el mercado mexicano. En este tiempo de pandemia, Promimex ha trabajado mucho en hacer cambios tanto personales como en nuestros colaboradores y fortalecer la tarea en equipo, por lo cual en esta segunda semana de procesamiento de minerales nos dimos la tarea de presentar estas conferencias. Debido a que nos es muy, nos es muy complicado visitar a nuestros clientes por las razones que ya todos conocemos, nos hemos dado la tarea de brindar estos dos días de pláticas con el doctor Francis Pitar a nuestros clientes mexicanos y clientes mineros de otros países, en donde hacemos hincapié de la importancia de obtener un buen muestreo y una muestra representativa en las operaciones mineras. Doy la bienvenida a este webinar y agradezco también a México Business por el apoyo a este evento. Sean ustedes bienvenidos. Muestreo correcto, la solución a la incertidumbre en el análisis metalúrgico. El doctor Francis F. Pitar es un consultor experto en muestreo, control estadístico de procesos y gestión de calidad total. Es presidente de Francis Pitar Sampling Consultants y director técnico de Mineral Stats Inc. en Bromfield, Colorado, Estados Unidos. Brinda servicios de consultoría en muchos países. El doctor Pitar tiene seis años de experiencia con la Comisión Francesa de Energía Atómica y 15 años con Amas Extractive R&D. Enseñó teoría de muestreo en las oficinas de educación continua de la Escuela de Minas de Colorado, de la Fundación Australiana de Minerales, el Departamento de Minería de la Universidad de Chile y la Universidad de Witwenstown, en Sudáfrica. Tiene un doctorado en tecnología por la Universidad de Albert en Dinamarca. Es autor de varios libros de texto sobre teoría práctica y de muestreo. Recibió la prestigiosa medalla de oro de Pierre G. Y por su excelencia en la promoción y enseñanza de la teoría del muestreo, Ciudad del Cabo, Sudáfrica 2009.
Contenido del curso. Día 1. La exactitud del muestreo es imprescindible en la contabilidad metalúrgica. ¿Por qué algunos cortadores fijos pueden estar sesgados? La exactitud en el muestreo es la piedra angular de la teoría del muestreo. Existen cortadoras fijas y otros dispositivos de muestreo, enérgicamente promocionado por algunos fabricantes conocidos, que están transgrediendo las reglas más elementales de exactitud en el muestreo. Por lo tanto, estos equipos no funcionan. Algunos muestreos conocidos que se usan cortadores fijos están sesgados por cinco o seis razones. Esto hace que sea extremadamente difícil determinar cuál es el efecto resultante. Les invitamos a que eh, interactúen con nosotros utilizando la sección de preguntas y respuestas que tienen disponible. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today here. We are very happy to have you here. And today, the course content of today is going to be about discussing that there is no substitute for sampling correctness in metallurgical accounting. And in this, in this, in this part of the lecture, we're going to answer the question: Why stationary cutters can be biased? Sampling correctness is the cornerstone of the theory of sampling. Stationary cutters and many sampling devices heavily promoted by some well-known manufacturers are transgressing the most elementary rules of sampling correctness, therefore cannot and will not work. Some well-known sampling, sampling using stationary cutters are biased because of at least five or six reasons, making it extremely difficult to figure out what the resulting effect is. And this is, these are the topics that we are going to address. Regarding the biography of Dr. Francis Pitard, he is a consulting expert in sampling, statistical process control, and total quality management. He is the president of Francis Pitard Sampling Consultants and technical director of Mineral Stats Inc. in Broomfield, Colorado, USA. He provides consulting services in many countries. Dr. Pitard has six years of experience with the French Atomic Energy Commission and 15 years with Amax Extractive R&D. He taught sampling theory for the Witherstein uh, Continuing Education Offices of Colorado School of Mines, the Australian Mineral Foundation for the Mining Department of the University of Chile, and the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. He has a doctorate in technology from the Aalborg University in Denmark, and he is author of several textbooks on sampling theory and practice. He is the recipient of the prestigious Pierre G. Gold Medal, Medal for Excellence in Promoting and Teaching the Theory of Sample in Cape Town, South Africa, 2009. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Pitard and his lecture. Okay, good morning, everybody. Today, we are going to do two lectures. The first lecture is a short one to make sure that everybody that is listening today is clear about the fundamentals of the theory of sampling. It's important for anybody to be involved or buying or installing sampling system to be familiar with the theory of sampling. Otherwise, it's very likely that the choice that will be made will be a very poor choice. So that lecture is important. And then after that, we will go to a more interesting lecture for you looking at sampling system, why some are good and why some are bad. Okay. So I may go to the first lecture. Okay. 
Everybody says this. Yes. Okay, good. So the first thing, that short lecture is very important because it set the, the course about what is it that we can do that will be fundamentally wrong if we are not careful. So when you take a sample, what are you after? You are only interested by one thing. It's the same for the geologists, the metallurgists, for metallurgical accounting and for the chemists at the laboratory. You are only interested by one thing, is to understand the variability on a large scale. Why is it different from one shift to another, that kind of thing. Unfortunately, when we take a sample, for, for many obvious reasons, we don't take a lot of material. We take a few kilos at most. And we hope that those few kilos are going to be representative of, say, eight hour shift, 12 hour shift, whatever is necessary to do good metallurgical accounting. So invariably, because of that, we introduce a new kind of variability. And let me be clear on that one. That new kind of variability that take place on a small scale does not exist in the plant does not exist in the stream that you are taking sample from. It is artificially introduced by us because of the way we take the sample, how much we take, what we do to it, and ultimately how we assay it. So all along, we introduce new kind of variability that are totally irrelevant. However, they are going to confuse us in a big way if we don't understand it. So there are several components in that small scale variability that is going to be a problem for us. Number one is going to be optimizing sampling protocol. How much material should you take? How often should you cross the stream? That kind of thing. And then after that, it's not enough to have a protocol to know what you want to do. You have to implement that protocol. And that is where the sampling equipment come. Now, this is an area that is uh, very important for us today, okay? We come back to more details here. And then after that, when you take the sample and take it to the laboratory, you still have to preserve its integrity all the way along in order not to, pre to introduce new bias. And then ultimately, you have to assay the sample for copper, molybdenum, gold, whatever you're interested in. So let's start with optimizing the protocol here. There are several sampling errors involved here if we are not careful. Uh, by the way, those sampling errors are never zero. But if we are reasonably careful about minimizing them, fortunately, they are not a bias generator. So that's the good news. It starts with the geologist when they take a sample 
core sample or blast all sample at the mine or things like that, they have to deal with what we call in situ nugget effect. You know, the mass of the sample to be taken will be greatly affected by how the mineral, the grain of mineral of interest are clustering or not. You know, are they disseminated everywhere or are they clustering in small pocket? That can make a huge difference. So that is a big problem for the geologist. So you take a sample, what do you do next? You, you know, um, if I take a sample, for example, in a blast hole at the mine, in a little pile underground, shall I take five kilo, 10 kilo, 15 kilo? What is the right thing to do? This is what we call the fundamental sampling error. So that is going to be the same thing. Uh, when you take a sample in the plant and uh, with a sampling station, at the end of the sampling station, how much should you take to the laboratory? Are you going to take five kilo, 10 kilo, 15 kilo? This is an important issue because if it's not optimized, we can have a big problem, okay? So usually the fundamental sampling error is not too much of a problem for base metals. You know, if you are looking at uh, copper, lead, zinc, uh, it's, oh, you have to be careful, of course, but it's not too bad, okay? However, if you are interested by precious metal like gold, you better be careful about that one because if you don't master it to minimize it, it will be devastating. Okay. And then after that, materials, different minerals have different density. You know, uh, the, the, the rock may have a density of 2.6, 2.7. The sulfide may have a density of uh, 4.5. Uh, chromite may have a density of 5.5 uh, or th th that kind of thing. Liberated gold and has a density anywhere between 16 and 19, depends what is alloyed with. So because of the, those big difference in uh, density, materials segregate. So that's another type of error you have to be careful about. How do you minimize uh, the, the, eff the negative effect of segregation? Uh, you have to group several increment to make a sample, several increment group together, you know, to uh, collected at random to minimize the negative effect of segregation. Okay, so that, that's protocols. You have to do your own work here. Then after that, you say, I have a protocol. I, I can explain to everybody point by point what is necessary to do. You can make a poster of it, put it on the wall so everybody is aware of what they have to do. Now the next step is going to be critical for us today is the implementation of that protocol. So now you have to have sampling tool. How do you do that? You know, at, uh, at the mine, we take a drilling machine, we take a shovel, scoop, or buckets, or whatever, to, to, to take samples. And then, but at the plant, in the plant, if you are doing uh, process control, you can take quick sample from some sampling systems that are not very good, but it's just process control. You want to look at trends. You want to be aware of a, a quick change in the process and do something about it instead of doing it too late later. So that's one type of sampling, but we're not talking about that kind of sampling today. Today, we are talking about metallurgical accounting, material balance, or oh, that is a different story because if you want to do metallurgical accounting, now you have to, to rely on samples that are unbiased. You know, that it's a, an entire new world. 
in order to do that properly, we have to make sure that some errors are not taking place, and I'm going to mention them, okay? The first one you're going to have to deal with is the increment delimitation error. What is this? When you take a sample in a stream, a stream is always segregated. There is no such thing as an homogeneous stream. So in order to minimize the problem here of introducing a bias that will be very bad for your material balance, every time you take an increment in that stream, you have to take the entire stream. There is no other way, okay? Because you have to always make the assumption that that stream is somewhat segregated, a little, a lot, and segregation is a transient phenomenon. It changes all the time. So this is a very uh, a big problem. So the increment delimitation error, they are rules to respect that are well established in the theory of sampling. You know, uh, if you're not familiar with the theory of sampling, by the way, at the end of this lecture, I will mention a book that I wrote that is in the third edition. You can get that book for yourself, read it carefully. It will take you maybe six months to do that. But at the end, it will be very beneficial for you because in that book, it is written in such a way that you can self-teach yourself. Everything is in here. There is no mysteries. You know, everything is in here. You can teach yourself. Uh, just to mention quickly, why did I wrote that book? Because my mentor was PRG and he wrote some books. He wrote, he read, he, he wrote many articles on sampling and uh, he was my mentor many years ago. And invariably at times I will go back to him and I say, Pierre, uh, in his book, how did you go from here to here? Because you don't explain how you did that. So please explain to me. And he will look at me and he will say, Francis, you know, I don't remember. I say, okay, thank you. That helps a lot. And I was kind of tired about this. So some years ago in the late 1980s, I decided to write the book myself. I said, this cannot continue because People get frustrated with those books and we go nowhere. Okay. So that was a delimitation error. Now, it, it is a geometric uh, boundary of the increment that is going to be taken all the way across the stream. Okay. What's the next thing that can happen? Imagine a cross stream cutter that cross the stream or even a stationary cutter inside a stream. What happens when the material comes in contact with the cutter blades? Material bounce, and if the cutter blades are not properly designed, if the cutter is not properly designed, you have a cutter that may become selective on what is taking. It may take too much fine and reject some coarse fragment or vice versa. So if the cutter becomes selective on what it's taking because of the way it is designed, you lost the battle right here. This is a devastating source of sampling bias and it's difficult to survive this, okay? So it's a very dangerous error the increment extraction error. We could have called it the increment recovery error. It's a problem of recovery, frankly. And then also, uh, material sampling should be proportional. What I mean by that is that every time you take an increment across the stream, the mass of that increment must be proportional to the flow rate 
of the stream at that particular instant. So when you have increments that are accumulating, uh, you should have a waiting sample, uh, a weighted sample, you know, where all the increments are the proportional to the flow rate at that time. Now, obviously, there is a, a catch here. If you have a delimitation problem, and if you have an extraction problem, there is absolutely no way that the mass of the increment would be proportional to the flow rate at that moment. So in a way, the increment weighting error depends on the correctness of the sampling system. So there is a chain reaction here that takes place. Okay. And then later on, when you have a sample and uh, you dry it, you filter it, or you uh, crush it, you pulverize it, you, I don't know what you do, you may screen it. There are new errors that are introduced that we refer to as preparation errors. Those errors are also uh, bias generators. So you, you have several types here that you are fairly well aware of it from experience you have. You have problem of contamination, you have problem of losing what you're looking for, you have problem of alteration because, uh, for example, we dry the sample at too high temperature, we, we can have human errors because uh, the people are not well trained enough, and you can have fraud and sabotage. Fraud is still very common in the trade of commodities around the world. Uh, we have been called on many times on this to defend some people about what was going on when they were selling their concentrate to some smelters, whatever. So, and then at the end of that, of course, this is not the object of the discussion today, but it's important. You have the analytical errors that can also be a problem. They can introduce some bias, you know. You can have, uh, they, they are, I explain here several source of problem for the analytical error or sampling, uh, done by the chemist at the lab is very vulnerable here. All analytical methods are vulnerable to some of those that are mentioned here. The scope versus the principle, for example. You can have additive interference. So you can have proportional interference. You can have a problem with the drain temperature baseline. You can have a problem with the dissolution technique. You be you know, the composition of the dissolution residues when you do uh, acid digestion, for example, you know, and just like sampling <clears throat> for analytical method, you can have contamination and losses as well. So here you have to be on top. The chemist has to be very careful that he is not the one that introduce a bias in methodological accounting, okay? So, and then, like I said earlier, at the end of the day, you are interested by the variability on a large scale. So you don't want all that variability introduced on a small scale to confuse you. That's why we emphasize on this first. Then after that is not over yet. You still have to worry about interpolation error. For example, do, should you have a sampling station that cross the stream every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes, every five minutes, so we can optimize that with variograms. Do you understand process cycle? They are very common in a process and 
they can be very detrimental to a sample if you have, for example, a sampling interval that is more or less in phase with a cycle, now we got a problem. Usually we can overcome that by not having a sampling interval that is systematic, but that is uh, stratified, random instead. Instead of, for example, taking a cut every 15 minutes, you can take a cut within every 15 minutes at random. It's not the same. So for metallurgical accounting, I strongly suggest you do stratified random sampling instead of systematic sampling across the stream. And then on a large scale, we can have also the weighting errors that can take place if sampling is not proportional as I mentioned earlier. So people get overwhelmed here because they say, my God, there are many problems well, set your priorities. <clears throat> have a vision here. You can do it in a simple way. For example, you have four box here. On the vertical axis, you put the effect of a problem. Is it a large effect or a small effect? And then on the horizontal line, you have the cost of fixing the problem. Is it a small cost or a large cost? Okay. So for example, if you have a small problem and it is a small cost to fix it. Do it. You have nothing to lose. Get rid of that one so you don't it does not bother you anymore. Okay. However, if you have a large problem and fixing that problem is a small cost, that's top priority. You must do that one right now. We have no mercy. Okay. The difficult one is this one. If you have a large problem and it is a large cost to fix it, you are in that box. Now we got a problem here. So because management is going to be very reluctant, for example, to change a sampling system for another, that's a big investment. We have to be put it on the budget of next year whatsoever, I don't know. So here you have to have a vision here of how bad that sampling system you have now is, how much dollar loss you may lose with that, that thing. So you can have, make an attempt to do a feasibility study. It's not easy to do with sampling system, but sometimes has to be done. And then there are the, the losers here. You have a small problem, but a very large cost to fix it. So that you can put it on the back burner. You can, don't worry about it. You may have more important things to do first. Okay, that's the way to look at it. As an example here, I put some example here, setting priority for sampling gold or base metals. In the top priority bo uh, box, I put uh, three things here that you may think that, why, why did you put this in that box? Statistical process control, SPC. Do you have a program for that? Do you have a Six Sigma commitment? Do you have a total quality management uh, commitment? So let's, let's be clear on this. Why is it that I put this in a top priority box? Very simple. If you don't have a clear commitment for quality from top management in your company, we are all losing our time. We are going nowhere, okay? So, make sure you have the support of top management to fix sampling problem in an operation. If not, you have a lot of work to do and a lot of convincing to do. And uh, I wish you good luck on that. It is often a big problem, okay? In the top priority box also, we have fundamental sampling error. 
optimizing sample uh, sample weight, subsample weight, analytical subsample weight. All this is very important, and it is an absolute must to optimize this. Preparation error in sample preparation room at the lab, etc. Uh, be careful not to alter the integrity of the sample. They are by generator, okay? So no contamination, no loss, train your people good. What about segregation? What do you do to minimize segregation? Combine many increments in a, in a sample, to call it increments collected at random, to minimize the effect of segregation. Okay, so that's top priority. And then here you have sampling modes, you know, in that box, systematic interval, stratified random interval, or, you know, um, that's easy to, to change, is not costly. The increment weighting error, if material, if the sampling system are correct, we are going to discuss this, um, this morning and tomorrow. If the sampling system are correct, you don't have to worry about that error. It will be negligible, okay? So, and then this error, you can have the bias generator, increment delimitation error, increment extraction error, analytical error, sampling interval, in situ nugget effect for the geologist, okay. And then what, what can come in that box? Be careful here. You know, we say, oh, I have a bad sampling system, but I can do a bias test to quantify the bias, and then I will decide if I can live with it or not. That's an, a common approach in management. Uh, the, the object of the lecture tomorrow is to tell you that this will never work. Okay? There are better things to do. Huh? And as far as sampling bias is concerned, because the sampling bias is always changing, there is no such thing as a constant sampling bias. So one day is bias one way a little, the other way, the next day is bias the other way a lot, the day after that it is not biased. You know, so the, the bias test go, the bias, the sampling bias goes all over the place. And as a, as a result, it is absolutely impossible to apply a correcting factor like you will do for an analytical bias that is better behaved usually. You cannot do a correcting factor for sampling bias. It's impossible. Okay. And then a lot of people spend too much money in round robin. They don't trust their lab anymore. So they send samples uh, to 10 different labs to make sure they know what's going on here. Be careful by doing this because what you do on this very often is you get confused and you start to worry about the problem of somebody else. Um, so if you are going to send sample to a novel laboratory, make sure you choose one or two with an international good reputation and stick to them, but don't go to 10 different laboratories. So that led to the concept of the three-legged table that I came out with when I started my consulting career about in um, as a consultant, you know, in uh, about 1985. I went to operation to do audit, to look at what people were doing, and uh, you spend a week with them, for example, and then I go home and I write my report. And then I send them the report. I don't hear anything from them. Then uh, usually they, they call me two or three years later and they say, can you come again to do another audit? We need you. I say, okay. So in my mind, I say at that time, they have fixed a lot of problems. 
they should have a good sampling system by now, better sampling protocol, et cetera. And then I go visit the operation for the second time. And I say, they, they didn't do anything. It's still the same problems as two, three years ago. So what happened? Well, we changed people, management was not willing to do the change you recommended and stuff like that. So since that happened many times, at one point I say, what is wrong with those people? I'm missing something. I'm missing something very important. So he didn't figure, I figured I did very quickly what was missing is the fact that I was not talking to upper management. When I go to the operation, you talk to uh, superintendent, to, you know, department manager, laboratory operators, laboratory manager, but you don't talk to the general manager, usually, or the CEO. You know, those guys are almost untouchable. So that is a problem. And that the first time I, uh, I deal with that was with a well-known company in Chile, Codelco. You know, I did some consulting for them for many years. And after five, six years of that game, I was introduced one day to the CEO and they say, oh, Francis, I heard about the good news, uh, the good work you do with, with, uh, uh, with pedal cars go at the, that is in charge of looking at this, at the operations and uh, tell me something, are we making progress? Oh, I say this, this is my chance. I say, I, thought, I, thought, I answered to him and I say, no, I'm losing my time actually. Oh, oh, and he closed the door and he said, Francis, what's the problem? I say, look, <clears throat> I convinced a lot of people at the operation of what should be done among superintendent and managers, but when uh, they pass the message to their boss, it becomes a problem because you say, you know, I don't care about this, I don't care about that, you're going to do it my way and get lost. So I say, oh, that is your problem, I fix it for you. And then six months later, that was year 2000, I don't remember. Six months later, I was back to Santiago in a room with the four general manager of the different operations and those guys are intelligent people, they learn fast, otherwise they will not be where they are. And uh, actually after that day, I did not have a problem. Things went uh, much better and we progressed much faster. So to talk to upper management to sometime change their culture, educate them a little bit, pays off in a big way, okay? So basically I compare the dollar loss you can have in an operation to a three-legged table where there are three sources of problems. You, can, you must have effective top management. You must have correct sampling, which is the subject of the second lecture today. And you must have people that understand variability, you know, it can be, uh, you know, the statisticians, uh, people in charge of process control or uh, metallurgical accounting or uh, laboratory or things like that. So people can do intelligent interpretation of the result they get every day. So they can feedback top management about the performance of the plant, okay? So three leg, if you break one leg, like you have bad sampling system, for example, there is no table anymore. Everything falls apart, you know? 
and that is the way with a three-legged table. So this is a very vulnerable area that we are going to go more in depth in the second lecture. So let's go to those legs a little more in detail. Why is it that top management is very important for them to understand the theory of sampling? Because they must identify structural problem. I put it in red. What is a structural problem? It's a problem that will always be here if you don't attack it, if you don't get rid of it, if you don't understand it, and it's uh, you lose the battle right away if you don't get rid of that problem. Okay, so I give you an example. You know, you have a bad weightometer, for example. A weightometer installed on a belt that is too long, longer than 150 meters, usually you will never know the tonnage. That's a structural problem because you rely on that tonnage to do some calculations. Uh, if you have an uh, in-stream stationary cutter, that's a structural problem. You are going nowhere. You will never achieve good metallurgical accounting. It's totally impossible. So we have to be very strict on this. We have to identify structural problems and eliminate them. You can have also a bad analytical method that can be a structural problem as well. Okay, so get rid of them. That is where you must invest money, invest in solutions to eliminate structural problems. But we have other kind of problem. Identify circumstantial problems. What is a circumstantial problem? Well, let's say you have some sampling systems that are not very good in the plant, but you do your metallurgical accounting every day, your material balance, every working shift and stuff like that. And then on Monday, the material balance is okay. So everybody is quiet. On Tuesday, you see some difference. You start to be concerned about yeah. it's okay so far. Let's say on Wednesday and Thursday, you have huge difference. So what do you have here? You are going to have a meeting right away. Because when you see big difference, you cannot explain. Somebody must be killed. Okay? That's the way it goes. So, and this is you are not attacking the structural problem. You are attacking a problem that shows up once in a while for some reason that you don't understand, okay? And that's a problem with sampling bias. The bias will be okay one day and it will be very bad another day. So if you don't go to the structure, you will, know, you will never solve your problems. So be careful about circumstantial problems that shows up once in a while they may be a red flag for you, but they may be a red flag telling you loud and clear that you should make an effort to identify structural problems. So time and money can be saved on circumstantial problems. Don't spend too much time and too much energy to, you know, to blame people and sometimes that uh, there is nothing they can do. You know, sometimes it's not the fault of operators when you have a bad sampling system. If the, if the sample is very bad, it's not the fault of the operator that is told to use that sampling system. So understand and act on all sources of variability. In other words, let's be proactive. And then the last leg, you know, uh, no, I mean, the second leg, correct sampling. So you have all the source of sampling errors here that I mentioned in that lecture. Uh, I list them again for you. In situ nugget effect, fundamental sampling error, grouping and segregation, increment delimitation, increment extraction, increment preparation, 
interpolation cycles, weighting errors, analytical errors. So there is a lot of work to do here if you want to be on top of metallurgical accounting. That's the point. That's why I, I show you that lecture. Okay. And then the last leg, we have to understand variability. Of course, that's uh, the ultimate mission of what we are doing. Variability generate visible and invisible cost. So variability is a problem, but it can be also an opportunity if you decide to have the right tools. You still have variability, but as if you have the right tools, you will be able to understand it better. So that is because there are many kinds of variability. All sampling errors magnify variability. And then you have geostatistics at the mind to help this, to help to understand variability. And what I call chronostatistics at the plant to analyze variability at the plant. And we have to minimize variability by a constant improvement, of a constant improvement strategy. You can get good at this, but it's a big commitment. You have to have a local champion for a given operation. You have to have a champion here that nobody is doing, okay? So that was the lecture. And uh, now uh, we, you want some question now or later we put all the question at the end. You hear me guys, Isabel? How do I go to? Hello, Dr. Pitard. Can you hear me yes. now? Excellent. Yeah. We should collect all the questions and we can answer them at the end, please, Dr. Okay. Pitard. Okay, okay. So I go to the next lecture. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So let's go to the next one. So this, this is a long lecture, okay? So right away, I have to tell you the bad news. On the market today, worldwide, you have about 75% of the sampling equipment that is available for you to buy at your operations that will never do the job, okay? It's a bad situation. The reason is very simple. It's because a theory of sampling is not taught as it should be at universities. So many people, uh, get a master or PhD and they start their career, they never heard anything about the theory of sampling. But guess what? The minute they start their career, sampling is something they have to deal with every day of their career. And they are not prepared for this. And that's the problem, you know? You have uh, many manufacturers around the world that are very good engineers. There's nothing wrong with them, okay? They are very good engineers. They know how to build very good machines, but they are not aware of the most fundamental principle of the theory of sampling. And therefore, they build machines that are flawed by design. And that is a very sad situation and like I say, the large majority of sampling equipment today on the market, unfortunately, is not correct. So because of that, we created uh, the World Conference on Sampling and Blending in uh, 2003. It's a conference that takes place on a different continent every two years. 
So we have uh, the next one is will be number 10 and it will be in Norway in next year. The last one was in, in China, the one before in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So the objective of that conference is to put together all the best experts in sampling from around the world and make a committee out of it, I'm part of it, and help manufacturers around the world. They can contact us, show us their equipment, and we tell them what not to do, what to do, how to modify their equipment to make it better for the industry, etc. So we we had good success with this, and we had uh, poor success for some manufacturer around the world. Say, oh no, we can we we why, why to change people still buy those systems so we don't have a problem to sell them so why why should we change anything that's usually the philosophy in uh, you know is a philosophy in the us is in the philosophy in canada is in the philosophy in europe so it's very difficult to change the mind of people when they are successful at selling their stuff to everybody around the world Okay, there are a few exceptions. And one of them was Techpromin. You see that was the cutter inside a Vezen sampler here. It was, you imagine uh, the Vezen sampler, the, the chamber is not in there, it's just the four cutters that are installed inside that rotate, you know. This is the best Vezen sampler in the world. And a lot of research has been done on this, and uh, thanks also to some people in Codelco. They have been helping uh, a couple of manufacturers, among them Techpromin, to come out with absolutely flawless cutters. You see that cutter on top of that chamber here? That is just pushed by end, and then you fix it with that bolt here so it does not move. It's, it's, there are no cutter blades. It's one piece. If it's well engineered and nothing can go wrong. The only thing that can go wrong, we have to take a, a look at the condition of the blades here. The edge, they should be very sharp. So it may need to to do some work on it. It may need a replacement after a year, you know, that kind of thing, but it's easy to fix, okay? So this is an example of a cross-stream sampler. You may have a little, it may be a secondary sampler, a tertiary sampler that is ab ab absolutely flawless, okay? It's just an example. So what is rule number one? Reliable sampling for material balance. It cannot be performed accurately on coarse material. So then the most vulnerable area for the plant is sampling the feed going to the plant. That is often a problem, okay? So you cannot take a sample anywhere you wish. You have to make sure you take a sample where we can indeed install a sampling system that makes sense. Rule number two, know the heterogeneity of the constituent of interest. It can be calcopyrite, calcocyte, it can be molybdenite, it can be gold, whatever it is. So mineralogical studies are essential at the beginning of any new project. Heterogeneity tests are used, are recommended to know if a certain type of ore is more difficult to sample than another one, you know. If I take example of uh, copper mine, you have some copper mines, the copper is not, not difficult to sample. 
in some of our copper mine, the, the, the copper occur as coarse grain of calcopyrite, and we can be challenged here by something far more difficult to sample. So today, a better way is to make sure the geologist collects the relevant information about the size, frequency, and distribution of the coarse particles of a certain minerals that they see on the core when they do uh, drilling. They do the logging of the core, and they usually take a lot of geological information, but usually they don't take the information that is relevant for us, sampling expert, to optimize sampling protocol quickly for this operation. So we have to go to the geologist here and insist that they give us the information that they are going to see on every core sample that they are going to log from that deposit. So we don't have a bad surprise later on about protocols that are wishful thinking or uh, just not optimized properly. Then and only then, sampling, subsampling, and analytical aliquot mass can be optimized. There is no other way. Okay. So rule number two here is very important. Hmm? Rule number three. Selection, selection of equiprobabilistic sampling systems. Hmm. What does that mean? In other words, selection of mechanically, mechanically correct sampling system. So how do we do this? This is a big problem. Uh, I, I mentioned something just to entertain you a little. Usually, I do consulting for mining companies. And they call me and they say, oh, we have a new plant that is going to start next month and we have the sampling system in here and you, we, want to, we want you to audit them. And I always say this to them, I say, why do you call me now? Why didn't you call me two years ago when you were talking to the engineering firm to when you select the sampling system? So what am I going to do now? I go visit the plant, I'm going to do this. Yes, sure, I'm happy to do that. But what, the only thing I can do for you now, it's a post-mortem analysis. Because if the sampling system are the wrong one, you're not going to replace them. Okay, it's too late. It's irreversible. That is a big problem in many new projects. The people don't ask assistance from reliable sampling expert early enough. Okay, so that is the inescapable and most logical and economical sequence: selection of a reliable sampling expert. Okay, you can. I'm not the only one. Okay, if you go to the uh, technical committee of the World Conference on Sampling and Blending, you can find five, five or six uh, good experts. And then number two, establish clear objectives with the client. And number three, design conceptually is the most reliable sampling system. And then number four, select the most appropriate manufacturers that can do the job properly. And finally, contact engineering firms and give them appropriate directive of what is it that you want. Don't let the engineering firm to decide what sampling system is good for you, that will usually, 99% of the time, will never work, okay? So, I give you an example here. This is a primary sampler for a flotation plant. 
you have to be very clear on what to look for. So you see there are about 12, 13 points here, 14 points that are area where things can go wrong. This is a side view of a big sampling system for a big flow, you know, for the feet, for example, going to a flotation plant. It is a correct system the way it is drawn, okay? But I want to just list areas that can go wrong to, to show you how vulnerable this is if it's not built properly. Okay, so, and if for each of you that are listening, I will tell you, take that as an exercise in those 13 area, tell me what go wrong, tell me which kind of sampling error can take place, and take, tell me what is it that has to be done to prevent a sampling bias from taking place. And you have half an hour to figure it out. And if, we, if you cannot figure it out by yourself, please go to a sampling course, a five-day course, things like that. And uh, we can organize that later on when the, the virus crisis will be gone. Or you can go to my book and everything is explained in it, okay? So let's say, for example, you have a, it's a pelican, big shape, you know. So it's a huge system that's very heavy that will cross the stream maybe every once every 10 minutes. The flow here can be quite large. It can be from 5,000 to up to 20,000 cubic meter an hour. So this can be a monster. Huh? So number one, <clears throat> When the matter, when the cutter go across the stream, you know, a lot of material enters the cutter. Cutter opening may be uh, seven, 10 centimeters, I don't know. It's, um, there are rules about this to respect. It cannot be as narrow as you wish. So a lot of material is going to go in right away when you cross the stream. So the level inside the cutter is going up and up and up. And if you reach that line, and overflow sampling bias right away, extraction bias. So here, the height of the, uh, no, this is what, this is, uh, yeah. You know, if the sampling stream comes here, you should have a scraper here. You, the last thing you want is a secondary stream here going underneath that will miss the cutter. So the cutter should reach under the discharge. If it's a vertical cutter here, it will never do the job. Another source of bias. Three, the, the cutter should be deep enough so when the material enters the cutter and splash on the end here uh, inside, if the material splash out and come out, bias, the job will never, it's impossible to do the, the job. So if the cutter is not deep enough, like is often the case, you when the cutter crosses the stream, you see a little geyser going up here. And this is, at that stage, you say, that sampling system is hopeless, okay? So the flow rate here must, as a, you know, <clears throat> the slope here should be about 15 degrees to do a good job. So it should not go out too quickly either, you know? So the opening here should be such that the, the level does not go up too fast. So you have to engineer the opening here according to the flow rate and the cutter opening. So it's, it's all this is difficult. You have to know the, the height of the maximum height of that 
stream that is going to fall here in order to optimize the length of the cutter, okay? It should be intercepted right in the middle. So you have to optimize that length. Yeah? You have to optimize that angle. So it should be perpendicular more or less to the falling stream and reach under the discharge here. You know, you have that system here that to make sure that the material that uh, those are uh, flange. And then here you have a box and uh, the material that follows, uh, this is maybe a rubber flange, for example. So the material that uh, one that falls from the mainstream outside the cutter here cannot find its way to the sample. That's very important. Okay. If that go to a box here, you have to make sure that <clears throat> the discharge of the material here does not come too high to interfere with the good functioning of the sampler. You have to have a good support. You have to have a good driving system. You see, and the, the list goes on and on, okay? So it's, uh, it's very important to be very careful with the manufacturer about all details. The victory for you is all in the details, okay? So you go to a good sampling book, the rules are explained, and sit down with the manufacturer and say, let's go point by point here to make sure that everything is under control, okay? So that's uh, a front view of the same sampling system. So now you have the stream here, stream discharge. This will be uh, 2.3 meter wide. You can have uh, the, the parking place should not be too close to the stream, 50 centimeter away, because when you start the cutter, he has to reach constant speed across the stream. So we cannot be too close to the falling stream to also prevent contamination from the falling stream. You can have visual inspection at all time. So you, that means you have mandatory well done inspection door. If you don't have well done inspection door, the sampling system is useless because you have to inspect it every day you have to clean it every working shift and uh, there is no this is not negotiable okay that's a lander where the each increment falls okay so again you know cutter opening here there are lists uh, for example i give you an, uh, some example cutter opening for very for flotation plant where the material is very fine. You may say, oh, the cutter is, the material is very fine, the ferro, one centimeter cutter is good enough. It won't work for the primary sampler, okay? One centimeter opening is okay up to 500 cubic meter an hour. Above 500 to 3000 has to be two centimeter. From 3000 to 5000 has to be three centimeters. From 3,000 to 8,000 has to be four, four centimeters. And then it, it goes on. The bigger the flow, the larger the cutter opening has to be. There are rules on this that are based on experience. Okay. That's a lander between the primary and secondary sampler. What to look for? Okay. Make sure the trajectory of the, you know, that's uh, the tube coming from the primary sampler. It goes from here to here. That is well located inside that lander, okay? The, the, the maximum volume in here should be such that is no, no more than one full, half, uh, one third full. 
you must have good inspection door. If you cannot, uh, no, sorry. Here you have sprayers, automatic sprayers that no material should accumulate inside. So you have automatic sprayer and, uh, working for each coming increment. Huh? You have good inspection door that you can have visual inspection of this inside to find out if it needs maintenance, if it needs cleaning, every shift. <clears throat> the height here should be optimized according to how much volume is going to come in here, of course. And then the diameter here has to be a little smaller than the diameter coming from the primary, okay? because there's a lot of volume coming from the primary. And because that volume is very big, we know that that uh, opening has to be big also, so the primary cutter does not overflow. And uh, therefore, that large volume that is going to be staying here for a while, you know, should be fed relatively slowly to the secondary sampler. So the secondary sampler, which may be a Vezen sampler, like I showed you earlier, that is going to take at least seven, eight, ten cuts from each primary in order to do a good job. Okay, if it take only one or two cuts, that won't work. So you see, everything is in the details. So that. Secondary and tertiary sampler for flotation plant, typical Vezen sampler, like I showed you earlier. You can have one, two, three, four cutters. That's up to you to decide and figure it out with the manufacturers. Okay. <clears throat> Same thing. Everything is in the details. You have all those points here where things can go wrong. You know, the the diameter here. You see that little detail here. The, the cutter should not be flushed with the chamber. It should come farther so the material does not follow the roof here, where you can have loss and materials that will not be intercepted by the rotating cutter here. Okay. So you can have, you must have a nice inspection door on top here. Rotating speed, not too fast, you know, 12, 13 rotation per minute at most. Most Vezen sampler around the world rotate too fast, up to 32 rotation per minute. They will never do the job. And then here, you have, you know, the cutter closest point. And this is a stream. The closest point, the opening should be like this. And then at the farther points, the opening is much more. So basically, to have the same probability of sampling at that point and the other point at the other end, the cutter must be radial. There is no compromise with this. If the cutter is not radial, the system is useless. So that is better explained here, you know. So that is an intercepted stream. The cutter should be long enough to have about five centimeters extra on each side. For to make sure that there's no bone bouncing material escaping. You should have a huge inspection door, not a little one that we can see nothing. Okay. The inspection door should be almost half of the top, not quite, but almost as much as you can. Inside the inspection door, you have a screen so nobody can put its hand inside when you look inside because when this is rotating, this is a main machine. Then you should have automatic sprayers that are in good working condition after every, after every primary cut that has been sampled. This should be, the, the cutter should be clean automatically. Okay. 
and the list goes on, okay, or in the details. That's an overview. That's the cutter I was referring about earlier. This piece here, blue and red, it's one piece, one piece of steel that you can remove and maintain it or put a new one, you know, and this is uh, the sampler in which you may have those one, two, three, or four cutter. It depends on the situation. You can, this is your, your choice to decide according to flow rate and uh, size of, you know, size of the primary sampler, etc. And this is uh, for solids. Sometimes you want to sample the solids after crushers, for example, before it is sent to a, to a, 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 a ball mill, you know, that kind of thing. So no, so sometimes it does not go to, to mill at all. If it's, it may go to leach vats, for example, so you have to sample the, the the solid as it go uh, you know is not is never going to be very fine if you if you're going to have a, a copper oxide operation you are going to have to sample the material relatively coarse okay maybe but when it's about quarter, three quarter of an inch in diameter so this is a uh, one example you know, where the, the material come at high velocity here, bump to a wall with stainless steel here, and then fall here, where underneath is going to be intercepted by a horizontal cross stream cutter. Okay, that's one example. Those sampler can be done in a beautiful way if they are well engineered. This is a more common case and is uh, quite common in uh, copper oxide operations, for example, you know. So all those points are very vulnerable, enough torque, enough uh, very strong uh, motor here, good support so the, the sampler does not flip when it crosses the stream, the stream has a lot of energy. The, the trajectory of the falling material should not go above the cutter. That will, well, that will generate a bias. The cutter should not overflow, of course. If material stick to the belt, you must have a scraper here that is, and the cutter should be able to cross the material coming out of the scraper. You know, the length of the cutter is critical. Its angle is critical. The angle here is critical. If it's not steep enough, the material will not go down. It will accumulate here and, kill it and create some problem, okay? This is a bottom dump. So it open, it's closed as you cross the stream. It's open as, uh, as you go to the parking place. So that has to be inspected every shift very carefully. It has to be in good operation so it does not leak when it crosses the stream, that kind of thing. You have to have enough vertical room to install a system that will be designed correctly. Vertical room available is often a problem with engineering firm, okay? The velocity of the stream has to be very careful here because if the velocity exceed, exceed uh, 2.5 meter per second, it's very unlikely that you will have a sampling system that can work properly, unless you vastly oversize it. So this, as we have to be careful here where we put that sampling system, so the conveyor belt does not travel too fast. So, What I can tell you right now is no 
the enemies. They are systems that will never work, okay? And you cannot fix them. It, they will never work, and that's the way it is. So there are three ways to sample a stream. You can take grab sample here by end at regular interval. This, some people do that all the time. This uh, is done sometime where it can hurt you most. I can see that practice still in operation in uh, some of the biggest smelter in the world at the reception of the sample at the port. They do grab sampling and then they tell you what the moisture content is. I have no, I have no illusion, it's impossible to know the moisture sampling, the moisture content with that kind of sampling. So it's ridiculous. So that is, uh, it's non-probabilistic, operator dependent, and will never work. So that has to be rejected 100% of the time with no mercy. Then you have in-stream stationary cutter. That is a case where you have only one cutter. So you, you take a little bit of the material from the stream all the time. You can have two cutter, three cutter, sometimes five, whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, this is a, it's a, maybe acceptable with reservation for process control. And uh, some of those sampling systems were designed with process control in mind. But the minute you have manufacturers that are trying to tell you that you can do material balance with this, you should, uh, you should show them the door and say, sorry, guys, we cannot work with you because we know too well that this is not appropriate for meteorological accounting. It will never work. So another option will be to take at regular interval the entire stream. If we stop the belt here, you put a frame and it will look like that. If the if it's a cross belt sampler, it will look like that. You know, as long as one side is superposable to the other side by a translation, you see that side is superposable to the other one by a translation. All of those are correct. Yeah. It's not because you have a cross stream sampler that you have a good sampler. If the, this was two here, what happened here? It's when the cutter crosses the stream and the speed is changing. So if it does not cut cross the stream at constant speed, then you will have a delimitation bias here and those are bad sampling system. So it's not, I insist, it's not because you have a cross stream sampler that you are doing a good job that cross stream sampler has to respect many very stringent rules in order to be in those cases that show here in yellow. So know the enemies. That one, it's absolutely useless. This is not a sampler, it's a gambling machine. Okay, so sometimes they say, oh, we agitate the stream in there, so when it gets here, it's homogeneous. It's not homogeneous. It's always segregated. So if, uh, if you agitate a stream, you, have, you still have segregation. The problem is that segregation takes place much faster, you know, then when it's, if you don't agitate the stream, the stream is very segregated and the segregation may not change very fast, but you always have segregation. And then the fact that you have that little tube here to take a little increment to go to an online analyzer, you know, at the entry here, you have a massive extraction problem because 
that in order for this to work, it will have to be isokinetic. It cannot be isokinetic because the material come at high speed here and bump to the roof. So therefore you have material coming back. It cannot be isokinetic, okay? Never be. So, and it's only taking a small part of the stream. This system, this system is going nowhere. It should be barely acceptable for process control and systematically, systematically re rejected for meteorological account. Stationary cutter in the stream, same thing. It's the same problem. You, you assume that the stream is homogeneous. It's no, there's no such thing as an homogeneous stream. So basically, it's highly dependent on the segregation in the stream, what you get here. So it's, it's even questionable for process control because the online analyzer cannot see a difference between the stream changing and segregation across the stream that is changing, which is not the same thing, you know? So the online analyzer can confuse a change in segregation across the stream with a process stream. And then you want to correct your process and you correct it at the wrong time in the wrong way. So even this is questionable for process control. And now you have system with multi cutters, you know, some of those have uh, five cutters across the stream, well, well known by manufacturer in Australia. There are many problems with this, you know, it's, uh, yeah. For example, the cutter is on top of a where we call here, that, that box. The material go under that, the wall here. And then it go against that wall. Now you can start to spin. So the materials that spin here, so the heavy material start to accumulate and concentrate. So the materials that go actually to the cutter is not what it should be. Once in a while, you get that material accumulating, finally finding its way to the cutter and sending the wrong message. This is not good. Like I say, maybe for process control with reservation for meteorological accounting, absolutely no way. Now, more problems. When you see a system like that with multi cutters, usually you don't have an inspection door on top, especially for the primary, which is difficult to see what is happening. What is happening is very simple. This is often a flotation cell, actually. You have a lot of material that floats here. And then that's a big problem because the material that float here and accumulates and sends the wrong message in the cutters, this is no good at all. You know, and then also that we have a rod here, they put a seal here to be able to empty the system whenever you want to empty it to do some maintenance or work on this. Uh, that rod interfere with the trajectory of the floating materials that go to the cutter, you know. You see it from the top here, so you may have five cutters. So for this, assuming that the, mat the stream is relatively homogeneous, is five cutter enough to do metallurgical accounting? I have doubt, but one thing is for sure, the speed inside here must be exactly the same as the speed outside. I wish you good luck on that. I know too well that this is not the case. It's not isokinetic, rarely. So that is a cross belt sampler that will never work. Too many problems. You know, you have the, the, the hammer cutter sampler crossing the streams that 
is incapable to take the fine at the bottom of the stream. The brush here that is supposed to push the fines here actually are lost going sideways because um, the stream is moving very fast, the belt is moving very fast. This comes with a uh, high energy. So as a result, the increments that goes here slam on that wall. Some of that material bounces back to the belt, bias. Some of that material stick to the wall and stay here, sending the wrong message on the next samples and over bias. You know, some of those buckets are not big enough to take the full increment. So at one point when they cross the stream, they no longer take, they just push. And that's another source of bias. Sometimes those systems are installed on uh, uh, slopes, suspended bridge. The material, the system is not very stable. So we have vibration that interfere with the correctness of the sampling system. This is not good. Too many problems. And then one of the biggest problems that you cannot see here, you have the, when the belt go to the cutter, crossing the stream here. When the, when the cutter is inside the stream, some material push on the wall of the cutter crossing the stream, but it's outside the cutter. That material that come to the, the outer, outer wall of the cutter is actually coming with the increments and created huge contamination. So that is probably the biggest defect of that because on this one, there is nothing you can do about it. There is nothing you can do about the bouncing back. There's nothing about, uh, you can do about the loss of fine in the bottom. You know, so there are too many problems that are unsolvable problem. So you should stay away from that kind of sampler. I show you a, a picture here from, that was, from an audit I did in a plant somewhere in Africa. And it's very common. You see here, you see, oh, well, that cutter is radial, but what about that one? That one, I think what they did here, they removed the, the cutter actually, and they didn't put anything. And then after that, they, they think that, well, you know, we have a reconciliation problem. No wonder if you have a situation like that on uh, every sam every uh, vision sampler in the plant, there is no way you can have a reconciliation, okay? So on top of it, they are very dirty. The cutter hedge are very poorly designed. Here they don't exist. So it's ab absolutely hopeless. And when you see a situation like that, you see, look, Let's go talk to the boss here. Why am I here for? You cannot find that kind of problem by yourself? Come on, give me a break. You know, this kind of problem should be, it should be obvious every working shift and they have to talk to the boss and the boss has to talk to the big boss and they have to, to fix it. Change that system that is totally useless until this is a, a, a monumental structural problem so that raises another question. Commitment from upper management to clean sampling system, to maintain them pre preventively, and to clean them every shift. If you, we don't have that commitment very loud and clear from top management, we lose our time. We will never have sampling system that will work for metallurgical accounting. Okay, so trust the leader in the sampling field. This is, you know, uh, it's a very sad thing to do, but around the world today, you may have three or four manufacturers of sampling equipment that can do the job. Two of them are in Chile. And um, the rest of it, they have a lot to learn. 
and they have to be willing to listen and change. It's a very sad situation, okay? But that's the way it is, unfortunately. So, that's my medal. This is a guy getting too old. Thank you for listening. And now I will be very happy to answer many questions if you have some. Thank you, Dr. Pitar. Now we're going to move to Felipe. He will be the one reading the questions to you. Okay. Uh, can I change the, the screen? I try. Can I see this better? I don't know. Oh, it's okay. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, hello, Francis. Uh, question number one coming from um, just one second. Patricio, Patricio Valenzuela. Uh, he has I know two him very well. Okay. He has two questions. First, it is not that a static sample for metallurgical balance cannot get a representative sample. This due to the characteristics of how to the sample is taken coding. It a beginning a very far from an spec representative sample. Why does the industry insist on buying equipment that doesn't contribute to a good sampling analyze? And the second one, and the second uh, question is my second question. Generally, the sampling system are made for the specific balance element in the metallurgical analyze. In our case of beginning able to balance a mix concentrate of copper and moly, molybdenum, this this is last one of trace is always difficult to balance since we use the same sampling system in the mix slurries that were studied for copper. We have had out experience shortening the sampling time to improve the representatives, but it's not enough since the time is totally different from the majority element. What is your recommendation in this case? Okay, uh, for the first question, you know the answer very well. As I explained earlier, it's a, it's a sad situation because uh, theory of sampling is not taught at universities. Therefore, you have to rely, the industry has to rely on the experience of the good sampling expert that you can find in the standard, in, in the um, uh, technical committee of the World Conference on Sampling and Blending, which is uh, the standard around the world today. But, uh, you know, you are facing a situation here where people, are, people want to sell what they fabric. So they are, what you have here, it's a situation where the marketing people of some manuf manufacturer of sampling equipment around the world today, the marketing people are very clever people. They go to top management right away. They go to the CEO and they make them some promises that they will never uh, fulfill, you know. And uh, so they have access to top management and convince them that they will save money by installing those kind of sampling system in their operation. And by the time you talk to the engineering firm, upper management already made up their mind. So that it's a marketing problem. It's a very sad problem, okay? Because it is borderline with ethics, borderline with fraud, and is not a very good situation, okay? We are very well aware of this. It's difficult to fight it, but that's why we have to educate top management so they don't fall in that trap. Easy to say, difficult to do something about it, okay? For the second one, your second uh, 
Okay, if you have a good, a flawless primary sampler, when you blend two materials, you blend material and you say, this is completely segregated, the stream is completely different from one side to the next. If the primary sampler is flawless, you should not have a problem. If you have a problem, it's because the primary is something wrong with the primary sampler, okay? Next. Okay, uh, question number two coming from Danilo Goncalves, Javier, process coordinator from uh, Anglo-American. Why correct sampling method, method is so important to method accountability and this, is, and this can affect the company performance? Okay, well, you know, if you, ex if you follow what I say during those two lectures, if the sampling system is not correct, you have many sampling bias that take place, not only one. If it was only one, <clears throat> well, maybe we can do something about it and try to quantify it, which is, uh, I doubt that it's possible. I will explain why tomorrow. But it usually is not the case. You know, for example, that last picture I show you in the lecture with the Vezen sampler that was poorly designed, not well maintained, not clean, etc. We I can list five or six bias here. So how is it conceivable that this will not have repercussions on your capability to do uh, meteorological accounting? It, it's, it's becoming wishful thinking to, to think that it can be done. It just cannot be done. It's impossible, okay? So it's the, the number of problems are too many. And of course, when, when this takes place, if you have many sampling bias taking place all over the place, uh, have no illusion. The economical impact of that is huge and is very difficult to quantify. And that is why we have to be preventive. <coughs> we have to change the culture. We have to educate top management, and it's the only way, okay? Okay, question number three. Yolanda Aguilar Hinojosa, is the nugget effect proper of only coarse cold particles, or is this if effect relative to the range of particulates in, this, in the sample? Can this happen in samples of very small particular sites? Yes, it does. For example, uh, okay, if I take, uh, um, you know, let's take an easy case, a copper. Copper should be easy to sample. Well, maybe, maybe not. So some deposit, the copper minerals is uh, finely disseminated. Same thing with molybdenum, some molybdenum deposit, the molybdenite is finely disseminated in the uh, in, uh, matrix, in the ore, and is not a problem. But in some case, the calcopyrite occur as big grains, up to half a centimeter, sometimes one centimeter, same thing with molybdenite. We have veins that can vein of molybdenite that go and broken up. So, if that is taking place, if you have a, when you take a sample at the mine, for example, and a blast hole, and you have coarse grain of calcopyrite that are up to one centimeter in the pile, this is going to be a big nugget effect problem for copper. There are some deposits like that. Huh? And so for molybdenite, molybdenite is even more a problem than copper, okay? And um, it's not a rare problem at all. And then it's going to follow you doing the subsampling as well. When you take, uh, you crush the material to, after you dry the material, you crush it to minus, uh, two or three millimeter, 10 mesh, 
and you take a 500 gram sample is if you have a pure grain of two or three millimeter of calcopyrite or molybdenite in a 500 gram sample, we may have a large variability here. You may have to take not 500 gram, but maybe one kilo, two kilo, three kilo, it depends, you know, to solve the problem. And then the problem continues as you pulverize the material very fine, okay? Let's say you pulverize the material to 95% minus 100 micron, okay? And then you take uh, 200 milligrams for the assay. If it's a very fine, finely disseminated copper or molybdenite, it may be possible to do that. But if you have uh, 250 micron molybdenite grain that have not been pulverized, you know, remember it's only 95% minus one micron, so you, what is a 5% plus? So you may have up to 250 micron pure molybdenite grain. It will never be representative, represented in a 200 milligrams. You can keep dreaming on that, it will not take place, okay? So the nugget effect can uh, follow you all the way to the end if you are not careful with what we call the fundamental sampling error. So that is why you have to do a heterogeneity test to optimize your protocols very carefully. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, question number four, Cesar, uh, Cesar Pastan, Pastan, sorry. Sample, sam, sampling error, geology, and analytic error, chemical, are always mentioned in the publication, but no metallurgical error, which is an areas as or more important than the others, why? Uh, no, there is no, no such thing as one important as the other. It's a, every area has its problem, okay? So you have problems doing exploration, you have problems doing uh, mining, you know, doing great control before it goes to the plant. And then we have our own problems at the plant also to, if we don't have good sampling system, we may complain to the geologists when we should not. Okay, and then also at the laboratory, of course. So everybody has his own area where they have their own problems. And that is why we have to communicate very well to work as a, not a local team, but a large team to make sure that everybody is aware of the problem of the geologist, aware of the problem of the metallurgist, aware of the problem of the chemist, you know, it's a, a well-integrated operation. You have, you have very good communication between geology, mining, metallurgy, and laboratory. That's the key. And if, if everybody walks in his little box and try to say, I'm doing well, and you are doing a mistake and stuff like that, you should not do that. You will not solve your problems that way. Thank you very much. Question number five. Edwin Patalanos, considering a maximum, maximum size of seven inches, how can we make an appropriate sampling on sack mill field? That's the question number one. Question number two, how trustable are the online size particle sampling? For example, the split system. Uh, can you repeat the second one? Yeah, the second one is how trustable are the online size particle sampling, for example, the split system? Online sampling. Okay. The first question, you have to use a very big uh, cross stream primary sampler, like uh, the one I show in the lecture, you know, for solids. Yeah? And that is, it can be a, a quite an expensive system, 
but it's the only way to do a good job before the SAG mill. It can be done, but it is an expensive and big system. It can be well done if the manufacturer is competent. On the second question, I'm not very clear about this. Uh, on, you want to use an online analyzer on course sample, on course material? I guess he's uh, talking about that. Okay, maybe we can uh, we can pass this question and. Um, but he maybe, if I understand right, he want to use an, an online analyzer on course material. Okay, that's I get the feeling that that was the question. Uh, okay. Is uh, if this is the case, it's very difficult. The material has to be relatively fine to do and not put an online analyzer on course material because. Um, the, it depends what kind of online analyzer you have. If you use X-Wave, forget it. If you use infrared, forget it. If you use uh, a gamma probe, you know, it can be done, okay? Okay, question number uh, six from Jose Guerrero. Do you recommend change the sampling system or only modify it? I think the second one is more usually in the mining operations. The, some, some sampler can be, if they, if they are not too bad, if they are good cross stream sampler to begin with, sometimes we can fix them a little and uh, make them to perform better. But if we are talking about metallurgical accounting with stationary cutter or probe, like a pressure sampler or things like that, you have to scrap everything and start from scratch. You have to rebuild them completely. Okay, question number seven, Jaime Herrera from Semiesa. Large mining companies, do their large scale operation have a very large number of samples? They have focused the process on the installation of robots for the preparation and analyze of samples. What is your opinion of the mechanized process? Do you consider that error has increased? Does this eliminate, eliminate human factor? Uh. It depends. Um, I am not completely against a robot, but you have to keep control of the robot, okay? So in other words, the robot may become a problem if, if it's not properly maintained, properly supervised, you know, so it does not eliminate, the robot cannot eliminate the presence of the human factor. So the, usually if you do the things manually, it costs quite a lot because you need many operators. And then you shift to a robot, okay? Which the robot is very expensive, but the people that are going to use a robot and inspect it and supervise it are very, very expensive people. The, we are talking about a PhD here. So I'm not too sure you save money with robots. Okay. So, but to, to answer your question, yes, it can be done with robots, but it has to be very well, the protocol has to be well established before we build the robot. The last thing you want is a manufacturer to say, this is a robot and that it works, and uh, my robot is standard for everybody. Everybody is going to be using the same kind of robot. That will never work. The robot has to be customized 
to your operation according to the kind of protocol that you want to implement for the kind of ore you have. That's, there is, that is not negotiable. So you cannot take a robot out of the shelf and say, this is working for us, it cannot be done. He has to be customized for you. Okay, question number eight, uh, Jorge Ruiz, he has two questions. Question number one, uh, okay, are, are we going to see exercise or what factors affect the metallurgical balance? Also some real applications. And second question, know the enemies number six or slide six, six. how do you expect the effect on a ripple split, a splitter for geolical, geolical samples at preparation to avoid mistakes. Okay, well, the, the use of rifle splitter is a lot of people don't use them properly. So it has good training. There are some rifle splitters that, use, that uh, work better than others. There are rules to respect about this that are well explained in my book. If you want more details about this, you go, you go to the book and uh, you will see every or how to use a reforce splitter properly and how it should be designed properly. Some reforce splitters, the way they are built, will never work. Like big fingers like that, you know, reforce splitter with big fingers like this, they won't work. It has to be very narrow blades. Same number of shoot on both sides. The, the shoot opening should be compatible with the size of the material that is fed to this. The operator should be trained to feed it very slowly in the center. If they work too fast, you will introduce a bias. So it's, it's easy to introduce a bias if the operator is not properly trained for the use of a rifle splitter, okay? So be aware of that. Uh, to do exercise, you say? Uh, he said uh, about uh, question number two, now the enemy number six or slide six, six. How do you expect the effect on ripple splitter for geolical samples a preparation to avoid mistakes? What was number six? I don't remember. Uh, the number six in, in your presentation. Yeah. I have to, I don't remember the slide. Maybe it was not a slide, only the uh, number six. Uh... Not sure which one is that. No, that one's another one. Okay. How do I go here? When you were talking about the uh, 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 about the no the enemies number six, you put on the top uh, the um, the title in, in that. Uh, My mouse is not working, darling. Okay, so we can pass to the to the second question, and we can answer the uh, that question later. Okay, question number nine, Jacqueline Brito. What are the main problems with the samplers available in the actual market and why they are being used so uh, commonly? Well, I, I explained that for now, yes. you know, so it's a, why is because they are not uh, correct by design and the people that design them and build them are uh, not respecting the rule of sampling correctness. They don't want to, to, to know anything about the theory of sampling because uh, the minute they start to read at the theory of sampling, they say, uh oh, if uh, then, uh, then I cannot sell my stuff. Therefore, uh, I don't want to know anything about this. As long as people are willing to buy this, this is the way it's going to go. That's a philosophy, okay? So, uh, you are dealing with a, a monumental problem here where this, this stuff has not been taught for too many years. So people go with traditions 
you have even some international standards that are absolutely completely out of what it should be, you know. And uh, so it, it's a very difficult situation because uh, when you are not familiar with the theory of sampling and you want to buy sampling equipment, who do you trust? You know, shall you trust the salesman? No. Shall you trust a manufacturer? Never. Shall you trust a uh, an engineering firm? Absolutely not. You have to go to an expert in that field. It's the only way. And there are not many. Reliable sampling experts around the world are many. Five, six, that's all. So, and that is what, where you have to start. Okay, if you don't do that, you are going to pay dearly for it. Okay. Okay, question number 10, Cecilia Mata. Good morning. Could you please give us an example of what could cause an increment extraction error applied to metallurgical samples taken to lead concentrates? I also like to know if there are recommend sampling methods to monitor heavy metal emission from a large smelter. Um. I was distracted by something. Can you repeat the question? Yes, sure. You don't mind. Good. Uh, Cecilia Mata, good morning. Could you please give us an example of what could cause an in increment extraction error applied to metallurgical samples taken to lead concentrates? I also like to know if there is a recommend sampling method to monitor heavy metal emissions from a, a large smelter. Um, uh, if the sampling system is not designed properly, of course you're going to have a problem with uh, heavy, heavy material like uh, lead sulfide or heavy minerals. You know, it's uh, it's 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 absolutely essential that you have well-designed sampling system, otherwise you will have extraction error, you will have uh, bouncing particles. Usually the system becomes selective by size. And uh, usually, the, for example, the lead, con a lead concentrate, the lead content will be different in the fines and in the coarse. And, um, and you will have a bias. So if the sampling system is selective on, uh, because the way it's designed on uh, size distribution, that uh, the game is over. You, you cannot win on that one, okay? Okay, uh, we have like uh, 10 more questions, something like that. Uh, would you like to take uh, uh, 10 more minutes answering the question or we can send it to you and we can uh, publish uh, this question with the answers in the in the uh, Mexico business web page. So, what would you like to, to do? We can continue if it's okay with you. Okay, perfect. Uh, Marco Antonio Nevarez from Grupo Mexico. Uh, could Dr. Peter talk more about the importance of taking and preparing the sample uh, at the laboratory? Uh, he doesn't explain where, but uh, I was maybe, maybe we can talk about yeah, the we, 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 that's uh, that's uh, to to prevent you you know when you do sample preparation, you send a certain amount of material to a laboratory. Let's say you are in a mine, you send blast all samples. You have about uh, ten kilo of material in a bag. They go to the sample preparation. As a sample preparation, you can crush the material finer, you can have a loss here. You can split the material smaller. You can, uh, if the sampler is not properly done here with a referral splitter that is misused, you can have a big bias here. And then after that, you can uh, pulverize the sample. 
you can pulverize too long and uh, lose some some gold, for example, lose some precious metals or uh, molybdenite because you you pulverize the material too long. So it's easy at sample preparation to introduce many little bias. Okay. It's, it can be done doing comminution in by the, when you crush or pulverize. It can be done when you do division, uh, misuse of a refill splitter, or a badly designed rotary divider, uh, you know, or uh, it can be also a problem at the laboratory is a way you take a subsample in, a, if, if you have a jar, that contain of 500 gram of material in which you have heavy minerals mixed in that jar. If you scoop your, your one gram sample from the top of the jar, you are likely to have a big bias. So there are ma many little operations doing preparation and analysis where things can go wrong, yes. Okay, second question. It's, training. it's all a matter of training. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question coming from uh, Jorge Campos from Fresnillo. What is the right method for pie sampling after it leaves uh, the mine? What is the method for what? Uh, What's the method for pile sampling? Pie after, sampling? Yes, after it leaves the mine. A pie sampling cannot be done. It's uh, essentially non-probabilistic. So you are at the mercy of uh, too many things. You know, the only way to sample a pile is to take the material, put it in a conveyor belt, send it to, uh, and then send at the discharge of the conveyor belt, you, you have a cross-stream sampler. Now you can sample the material properly. To sample a pile, many people do it but it's a, it's a waste of time or waste of money. You cannot get good information that way. Okay, Gerardo Miranda from Penoles. I have a pool, of, uh, a pool flow of 650 uh, meter cubes. How big does the representative sample have to be for doing a metal, uh, metallurgical analysis? Does, uh, does TechRoomin have the capacity or, or, or I, any, I have, any brand? Can, can you repeat the beginning? I have a... I have a pulp. I, a a pulp. Is, uh, uh, yes, a pulp flow of 650 uh, meter cubes. How big does the representative, representative sample have to be for doing a metallurgical analysis? Does TechRoomin have the capacity? Uh, the material is very dry. No, it's a pulp. It's a pulp, I would say. It's, it's a pulp. pulp. So, a pulp, yeah, the tech promin can uh, devise, uh, modify a vesin sampler for that, but it has to be customized for you. Yeah, you can, they can do it. They can do it. It has to be customized. Okay. Uh, Next question, Christian Kuro. What are some real cases of sampling of feeding? No, I, I, Johnny, uh, Johnny Aviles, what is the best test to know the samples uh, heterogeneity? Uh, the, the best, they are heterogeneity tests that are available in the literature, in my book, or in my, some of the paper I published. But the, recently, I changed my philosophy a little bit on this because it is actually easier and a lot cheaper and faster to ask the geologist to provide you the information you need when they do the logging of core sample early in a project. So if they were providing that information properly, you don't need to do heterogeneity test. You can do that, use that information right away, do some simple calculation and figure out what the protocol should be. And I think that approach is superior to a heterogeneity test. 
the heterogeneity tests are okay, but they, they have uh, the, the only problem with heterogeneity test, you depend, you highly depend on a representative sample to do the test. That can be a problem. You never know where that sample come from. So, but if you have all that information properly collected during the logging by geologists, that will be unmistakable. You can use that, that information and you can figure out what the protocol should be in a beautiful way. Okay. So. Uh, okay, other clients were asking uh, where they can get uh, your book. Or they can oh, ask where you uh, book. You have CRC Press. Oh, no, I have a better way. You go, you go to the internet to Francis Peter's books. And you will okay. get, you get the information right away. Okay, perfect. Uh, Claudio Rodriguez, how does moisture affect cooling angles? What is the best angle increment? Angles? En angles, the, the angles, the curves. The angle, the, or the, the yes. angle when you cross a stream, the, <clears throat> When you cross the stream, the, the falling stream and uh, the cutter should be at perpendicular to the falling stream, plus or minus 15 degrees. That's the tolerance, okay? So relative to the falling stream, plus or minus 15 degrees. Okay, uh, next question, Antonio Lopez. Actually, how, how is the meal the mill size fit to mill sack and discharge and hope sampling correctly uh, in the discharge. I'm not clear on the question here. Uh, me neither. Okay, actually, actually, hope is the mill size fit to mill sack and discharge. They can okay. Maybe maybe the question is here. Try to okay. Try to ask the person to rephrase the question, and I will answer it tomorrow when we do the other lecture. I'm not clear on the question at all. Okay. Uh, other question, can you have a representative uh, sampler from an st static sampler? The flow can be homogeneous at the exit point of a centrifugal, cent centrifugal uh, pump? No, no, the answer is no. The, there is no such thing as an homogeneous sample for that kind of sampling. So it's, um, it's just the wrong place where to take a sample. You have to find a way to do a sample in an overlocation. Okay, uh, next uh, question, Edgar Escalante. I understand that the thoughts are about the metallurgical process. However, could you make some recommendation about the geological sampling process for the field and drilling stage to provide samples that could meet the quality requirements for the next phase of the mining process? Okay. Well, this is a very vast subject, you know. If you have, a, if you have an exploration program, it's very important to do diamond core drilling enough to have a good idea about the mineralogy of what you're looking for, base metals or precious metals. So that is step number one. You know, some people go to RC drilling to save money too soon. So we don't get the proper information that we need to optimize sampling protocols. 
So you have to you have to do sufficient diamond drill sample, so diamond drill diamond drilling, in order to provide very good not only geological information that is very superior to river circulation, but also to know the mineralogy of the important components very well and optimize sampling protocol in a, in a good way. And that will affect also how we sample later on uh, at the mine for great control, you know, uh, depending on our findings in a preliminary, in a, during exploration and uh, with the diamond drilling, we will know better what kind of sampling protocol we need at the mine, for example, in an open pit, if you have blast hole, shall we take uh, 10 kilo, 15 kilo, 20 kilo, what is the right thing to do here? You know, we cannot, uh, we cannot do anything we wish. We have to follow some rules. Okay, last question and the other one, so we will answer by separate. So the last question for, for this date uh, from Vanessa Andrade, what's your opinion about last hold sampling method on the case of a copper mine for great control uh, purpose, consider, considering the manual sampling process, contamination, etc. Blast hole sampling? Yeah, blast, blast hole. That's That's what what I'm I'm you know, uh, if you go to my book, there is a full chapter on that. And I published some paper on this, uh, underlining the, the limitations of blast hole sampling. There are many problems, okay? Much more problems that may, people may think. And um, in some operation around the world today, the problem was so severe with blast hole that they actually abandoned blast hole completely and do a separate drilling with reverse circulation to overcome those problems. It depends how the, the deposit is, uh, is set. If the for example, if the mineralization is vertical, big problem. If the mineralization is horizontal, big problem. If the mineralization is at an angle, maybe we can do the job relatively well with, uh, with blast hole. So it depends on the deposit. Huh? It's, uh, you know, some, some operation is no problem to do blast hole sampling, some of us, it's big problem. Okay, I would say for today is a uh, is a uh, we finish for today the the question that they are still open, so we will answer and we yeah. will send it to the, to the customer tomorrow. Yes. I will so, uh, I will uh, and I will think about all of those questions you had today. To we to tomorrow. Tomorrow, we have the same amount of time available, right? Yes, sir. Yes. But my, my lecture is shorter. So tomorrow, we can have many more questions. OK. So I will say this uh, in, in Spanish to, to uh, the clients. Yeah. Para mañana, la presentación será eh, un poco más corta. Entonces, las preguntas que hayan quedado pendientes se seleccionarán. Y de una otra manera, para comentarse las mañanas al al doctor Francis Pitar con lo que pueda eh, o las preguntas que existan y se abran para el día de mañana. Agradecemos su atención eh, y agradecemos su tiempo por estas dos horas y media de estar aquí hablando con nuestro experto, el doctor Francis Pitar. So Francis, thank you very much for your time. So we will see you tomorrow. So it's a pleasure to, uh, to hear you about, uh, about your theory, about your experience, about uh, the correct sampling for uh, in for the operation in the mines. My pleasure. Thank you, you very tomorrow. much. See you Thank tomorrow. you very much for everybody and have a good day. Nos vemos mañana. Muchas gracias. Misma hora. 10 de la mañana de México, hora centro. 11 de la mañana de de Chile y 9 de la mañana ya de Colorado, donde está.
and Dr. Francis. Okay, thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.